Zap Dragonzord has been summoned, and it might be my worst Hasbro Power Rangers experience yet. Starting with the very interesting toy history, Zord Ascension Project Dragonzord, codenamed Z0121, denoting its first appearance being from the 21st episode of the first season of Power Rangers, was initially leaked towards the end of 2021 and officially revealed as Mega Dragonzord in a Hasbro presentation to retailers in February 2022 and went up for pre-order in June 2022. Some people managed to get theirs in October of that year, and it's become slowly more available in the months that followed. However, not in the UK. As Collector's Den posted, Hasbro are not bringing Zap Dragon's Sword over to the UK as a wide retail item. This seems strange when Zap Megazord had even made it onto Amazon UK's Black Friday deals seemingly out of the blue. They expect to have to refund orders for Dragon's Sword, which will apply to many well-known websites. I do wonder what's happening here, but I do suspect an awareness of quality concerns might be related to the decision to limit the global reach of this toy. The bigger mess they make, the bigger mess they'll have to clean up. Anyway, I didn't pre-order mine, I actually bought it from an online retailer who must have secured their limited stock allowance from the US. For my own personal toy history though, what a difference a day made. Just 12 hours after completing a live stream I did where I generally praise this thing, with a few familiar hesitations, the next day while prepping it for this very review, I experienced my first port break. It happened while separating the drill, the tail from the main chest piece. The plastic used on both is not great. I don't think the solution they've incorporated works. The tail segment ports are way too tight, and even on stream I mentioned that they were weathering already. The plastic on the chest piece is too weak and cheap. There's no sugarcoating that, it feels so hollow. Genuinely, Happy Meal toys were of stronger durability than this. As I was pulling them apart, I'd gotten used to it needing uh, quite a bit of force, a bit of oomph, but hadn't been prepared for half of the port shearing off inside the tail port. I guess that need for oomph to separate the pieces should have been my first red flag. I couldn't believe it in a toy I'd used maybe three times in two weeks for this to already have happened. Hasbro, what gives? Well, clearly your plastic gives. I questioned myself, no mean feat, when you've had four of the five combining versions of this guy, and referred back to the instruction sheet, and yeah, step 17. The tail links are supposed to directly plug into the chest plate. This is what you're supposed to do to create the drill weapon. Some people will no doubt be typing in the comments, well you should use hot water or a hairdryer. No. This is getting ludicrous. It started with the heads in the lightning collection snapping off at the neck port. My Lord Draken neck connector broke out recently. I managed to get it back together but there's a crack in the neck now and I have no idea how I'll ever change the head on it again. People have been experiencing that a lot more frequently with the newer figures and people's sensible advice has been to heat the plastic up to make it more malleable and less shatterable. So I'm asking, but why have we, the fans, readily accepted this as prevailing wisdom now? Why do we even have to do this? Why can't Hasbro, a toy company, just manufacture toys that are fit for purpose? Or will they have to start including a hairdryer in the box for each toy. And so what about a Dragon's Order replacement, you might wonder. A lot of you on Instagram were quick to point out I should contact Hasbro customer service. Yeah, no dice. Part of their reply said, I am saddened to hear that you have a problem with your product and can fully appreciate the disappointment caused. We pride ourselves on ensuring that our qu <laughs> We pride ourselves on ensuring that our products are of the highest quality and are concerned to learn this product was unsatisfactory. Regrettably, we do not hold stock to offer a direct replacement and will not be receiving further inventory. <laughs> so a brand new toy and they've already washed their hands of it. Brilliant. Yada yada, approach the store for a refund under the Consumer Rights Act. So yeah, that's what I'm gonna have to do because this is unacceptable. I've had enough Dragon Zords in my time to know when one is an absolute stinker. Not in how it looks, as with most Megazords Hasbro have created so far, the problem isn't in how it photographs. 
but in how it functions. It seems that we're skating so indiscriminately into how something looks that we're forgetting that it also needs to be tangibly satisfying and definitely not a risk to even use for its intended purpose. The Instagramification of products, like with food in restaurants, are in delivering visuals over experiences. I mean, I've definitely had an experience with this, but it's really not been a good one and has genuinely shaken my confidence in this whole line. I mean, I paid more for this than I did for my Soul of Chagokin Dragonzord four years ago. Is that not enough for people to hear the alarm bells ring out on this one? So I'm sorry to have to begin the review with a rant, but I really feel that this, more than any other Hasbro product so far, has been such a crunch point, a breaking point if you will. And we are fully at a crossroads here, marred by less than stellar efforts across the whole line in the year leading up to this release, where things have to improve, and quickly, in order for it to continue. This seems like a good point to mention the weight of these toys. Now, I'm not suggesting that they need to make it out of die cast or metal, but look at the weights for Megazord and Dragonzord. Zap Megazord is both the tallest but lightest version that I own. Dragonzord is the lightest as well, and its tail is roughly double the size of the original. When the box packaging weighs twice what the product inside weighs, we have a serious discrepancy. So no, don't misconstrue my words, I'm not saying they need to go back to the Bandai Legacy make them way too heavy phase, but don't do this either where they're barely there. Where pulling apart a transforming section pulls the plastic port off with it. Acknowledge that to make durable transforming toys, they need to be able to transform. If they need to make some shipping weight back up, just make the box out of something cheaper that weighs less. Because this isn't working. Speaking of the box, it's very nice again, and I'm slightly less bothered by the paper baggy solution this time, as I found the use of space within the box to be nice and quite exact. The use of the Green Ranger cockpit insignia really gives this another nice connection to the first Megazord release, even in this smaller form factor. Dragonzord is certainly a unique robot to try and talk about, and so once again, I think this deserves a unique approach to a review, opening segment notwithstanding. Unlike the Megazord, there's not five separate Zords to talk about this time, but there are three separate modes, of which I've got four versions of each. So I'm going to cover everything you know I always do, the design choices, the differences to the previous versions, what's bad, what's good, by going mode by mode. For the Zords of Mighty Morphin, we built such tall foundations over the decades that it wouldn't be fair to you guys as fans to just think of this as one zap toy in isolation. And so let's get started by going on to Dragon Zords Zord Mode. Tommy's signature Dragon Dino Zord, technically, is often lauded as being one of the most iconic Zords of the line. Its obvious Godzilla influences make it stand apart from the usual Tyrannosaurus approach. It was Sentai's first six Ranger Mecha back in 1992, which is why by the standards of nearly everything that followed, it was a pretty simple six Zord with no transformation gimmick of its own. Even as soon as the White Tiger Zord the following year, the Six Ranger Zord could do something else, whereas Dragon Zord was more of an oversized dinosaur that required combining with the team's other Zords in order to do something else. The dark colour scheme is certainly one of this thing's main draws, with unique patterning throughout the robot, several impressions of the Dragon Zord power coin symbol, and the franchise's first of two Zords that carry the Z emblems, originally standing for Z Ranger. I like to think of it as standing for Zord and has now been retroactively incorporated as the logo for the Zord Ascension project. There's a bit of a return to the past of the chromed out plastic of the original. That's something that was mattified in gold painted metal for the 2014 Legacy version and then made into shiny gold plating for the Soul of Chagokin version in 2018. Here we are another four years later, and that chromed plastic has become even more prominent throughout the entire robot. 
What's new this time then? Well, Zap has incorporated a good amount of articulation in the legs and thighs. While they don't oscillate outwards like the Soul of Chagokins could, they still offer a significant upgrade over the original and even legacy versions of the toy. It all helps you add a bit more posability to this thing, and while the hands have never been particularly expressive because of the limitations of them anyway, Hasbro have found a solution there too. While Legacy would be the first to introduce some interchangeable hands for Dragonzord, something Soul of Jagokin would continue with, Zord Ascension Project goes even further by adding a third set of hands, this time with the missiles loaded into the fingertips. You can even give the impression of them firing by swapping back to the first set of hands and using plug-in special effect pieces, a lightning collection hallmark, to show them this way. The only thing still missing is a smokestack for this thing to chew on. Zap features more panelling detail, we got a lot of this on Megazord and the Dino Fury Zords, and here it is for Dragonzord, notably on the sides of the neck, the hips and the feet. The tail is another critical part of the Dragonzord, and has seen a great development period over the past decade. The original was nothing special, even less articulated than the T-Rexes but Legacy added popping joints between the tail segments, though still forgot to make the tail poseable at the base. The Soul of Jagokin de-accentuated the tail slightly while building on the innovations of the Legacy version. This one might be the best of all. Zap clearly liked what SOC did, but with a bit more size, like the Legacy version. Obviously the broken clip within my one means I'm operating with one link less than it should have. Not the end of the world, but quite annoying nonetheless. At least I found a workaround for this. The cockpit. So for this one, it's in the style of the Ranger's individual Zords, rather than the 3D printed one that showed all five in the Megazord's head. So kind of cool, if you're wanting Tommy to look more a part of the team, you can do that with one of the two provided miniature figures. Again, I think they're a little too small to think much of, and being all one colour dilutes the point of these, I think. They're a nicer idea than can be credibly realised. If they can't make them any more detailed, I wouldn't much mind if these quietly vanish from future releases. While we're on the topic of Dragonzord, let's mention the difficulties you'll probably have with this thing, because they are numerous. Swapping hands is more difficult than Lightning Collection figures, because the ball joint peg can actually ricochet away and you'll need to use another implement to prise it out again. It's very frustrating. You once again benefit from heating up the hand ports in order to get them on. The gold shoulders clip onto the sides extremely tightly, but all that means is that they creak angrily when either attached or removed. The eyes are on the same hinge as the lower jaw, so whenever you close or open its mouth, you're inadvertently moving the top set of teeth and eyes out too. Not that you can really see the eyes anyway. And the feet are on a ball joint, which implores the Zord Ascension Project's patented break it till you make it feature. I was so scared on my live stream to even move them, but when I was assembling the Mega Dragon Zord with the shield attached, I realised the only way it was going to work was if the feet could articulate, which the instructions kind of inferred they could. And so I went for it, and now they move nicely and so far aren't loose. I just wish the zap line didn't make you feel like you were going to break joints in order to gain access to them. This was also a thing on the Triceratops wheels I didn't know about. And while we're covering things that I didn't know about for my Megazord review, there is some articulation in the Mastodon trunk, just not what I was expecting. Part of it spins around. Something new that's kinda helpful are tiny tabs inside the shoulder joints, so whenever you can't quite prise the finger guns out or accidentally slot the shoulder in without the hand attached, these are a great addition to pull them out again and appear very subtle. Anyone else notice that they've rounded off the back of the Zord where the tail is? This is for the first time. And so on to Dragonzord Battle Mode. For me, the coolest thing the Dragonzord did was this Warrior Mode or Battle Armor Mode. It steals the Megazord's appendages for its own benefit, resolving the Zord's own shortcomings, it takes its greatest strength in its obscene armor plating, and repurposes the tail and chest piece into a staff weapon, which also functioned as a drill. 
You gotta love the sheer absurdity of that. They even had a camera angle from inside the hole it would burrow into the monster of the week as it destroyed it. On the show, this was pushed as being a power-up over regular Megazord, and it's still one of my favourite duos to put together. It also feels much more like a current modern-day combination, where there's actually a lot of Zords left over, excluded from the combination. I would say this Megazord's main design feature is that the chest plate is in the shape of the Dragon Zord power coin. This wasn't something I consciously realised when I was a kid for a long time, because the original really didn't even try to look like it that much. The legacy version did try a bit harder, but proportionally it looks kind of over large to the rest of the robot. Soul of Jagokin, unsurprisingly, delivered the best, most finely detailed version so far. It looks beautiful, a smooth plated gold with the stenciled pattern artwork and clearly defined end zones where the black bits divide the symbol up. This was, and I think still is, the one to beat. And so for Zord Ascension Project, clearly this was the one to model itself on. The end results aren't too bad. They tried to go a bit further again, adding more detail, both in the form of panelling along the gold, raising the patterning symbols, and incorporating their famous speckled effect as the backdrop to those lines. But Hasbro's factories prove, as usual, that they only put paint to plastic with about 95-96% accuracy, as you can see should be green speckles on the gold section, and you can see some green overspill on mine on the gold section, and the cursive gold patterning could be tidier in the tail ends, though perhaps this is as neat as their current mass production factory equipment can get them. The Dragon Zord coin is definitely a difficult one to get right, but this isn't a bad effort by any means. I can give it that much. The face on Mega Dragon Zord has gone through the ringer a few times. The original 90s toy suffered from a really long, flat face. The Legacy incarnation did fairly well, changing the shape of the mask outline. SOC's face made the diamond pattern a little bit too high and the visor seemed a little too big as well. Here, they're confident that they get it, I mean they made it the main focus of the box cover. They haven't done badly, though they do make a new design choice by making the red visor semi-translucent, so you can see eyes of a face behind it. Actually, when it's first introduced in the show, you do see a flash of glowing red eyes behind the mask. So there is some precedent for it, and honestly it's subtle enough to be seen either way, so I don't mind it. The drill is another main feature for Dragon Zord Warrior Mode. The first incarnation had a sound gimmick, but was very deep because of the battery compartment with a stubby tail, a separate pipe piece for simulating interacting with the Megazord's hand, and a general inability to hold it in two hands like it could on the show. The legacy went a bit nuts with the tail, necessitating the chest piece having an expanding midsection. The base of its staff wasn't even all the same height, and so it balances precariously, though it does manage to balance it with a tight grip on the handle which deploys out from the shield piece. Soul of Jagokin famously offered two solutions, a too short stand that emerges from inside the chest piece itself in a way that assumes some show law in a thoughtful if underserved way, or relink some of the tail segments with a brand new screen faithful version which flattens and compresses the shield like it's become a storm lightning megazord mode or something. Neither of these two versions manage to hold it properly, though you can cheat or flub your way through it with enough patience and balance. I think Zap borrows the best parts of all versions, the deploying handle from Legacy, the stand piece being separate from the original, and the tail links being adaptable from the SoC. Along with a bonus third set of hands for Mastodon, the result is this becomes the first combining Dragon's Zord battle mode to comfortably be able to hold the staff double-handed. Yet, yeah, you do need to once again apply some heat, of course, to the new third left hand of the Mastodon to make it fit the chunky staff in its grip, but once it's in there, it's got a good grip for posing. Nothing comes close to this authentic look, and this is one of those editions where Zap gives the impression that they know what they're doing, even if the tight hand is kind of frustrating to work with. 
Lastly, the Mega Dragon Zord. Love it when they incorporate two names into a combination name like Ninja Mega Falcon Zord. Mega Dragon Zord is unsurprisingly the full combination of Mega Zord and Dragon Zord and gives you a six Dino Zord combo. Yeah, if Battle Mode rubbed you the wrong way with leaving out the T-Rex and Pterodactyl, there's a way to bring them back into the mix. Here we have the Dragon Zord splitting down the middle with the head serving as the connector, something that you could actually unclip really easily with the spring-loaded connector used on the 90s version. For Legacy, this was an unwieldy, heavy bit of kit that would scratch the Megazord's face paintwork, would often lose its grip on the feet positioning and cause the Megazord to buckle on its badly designed knees. Solar Jagokin neatened up the whole assembly and managed to forego needing any pull down support tabs for connection. For Zap, this one is interesting because the lightness actually works in the combination's favour. The tail and chest piece technically don't play a function in this formation because they're needed for the Ultra Zord, the tail admittedly less so, but you can attach both if you want to use all the parts. When holding the sword and shield it means that just the staff base and leftover hands and effect pieces aren't needed. A very good result. The big controversy for this one was the addition of the fingertip plates. This I believe was Hasbro trying to right the wrongs of the SoC, something that I'd picked up on even at the time that their version of doing the Dragon Zord hands rendered them into the far corners of the shoulder plates. Previous versions made more of the in-show impression where the finger blasters are much more evenly distributed throughout that crevice. Zap's version is still better than SOC, the thumb is not positioned at such an extreme right angle so that's actually going to be totally fine for most and you could even still attach either the missile fingers which wouldn't be accurate or special effect pieces if you wanted to. But Hasbro's new plate effect method really put the prominence back on those fingertips even though this raised black clip on piece is another deviation from a true transformation. Much like the stabilizers and opening hands of Megazord, it's there if you want it, it's ignorable if you don't. Best of both worlds. You know what, if we're going to put some kudos on Zap for something, it's actually still going to Zap Megazord, designing the Mastodon in such a way that you can even gently raise his arms at the elbow just slightly and with the shoulder pads dangerously popping out, but a cool trick that we haven't been able to do in any of the versions so far. And even though the M has dropped sideways, I still quite like the idea that this represents Megazord, albeit accidentally. The Megazord holds the Dragon Zord really quite well, and proportionally, I find myself enjoying this combination much more in Zap than most of the previous versions, even if SoC delivered a much more vivid double effect head whereas the Megazord head gets quite lost in this version. To conclude then, Dragon Zord is the six of the seven Dinozords, and at time of posting, it doesn't seem like Zap will be taking us to the finish line of the Dinozords anytime soon, but you never know, and the Season 1 Ultra Zord has proven to be too tantalizing for any combining version of this trio to skip out on so far. While I think there's something to like in each mode here, that still doesn't mean this is a full recommendation from me. Low quality plastic and brittle connectors should be your biggest takeaway from this guy. I'm left with the view that Hasbro don't fully get Power Rangers combining toys yet. They are improving all the time and Dino Fury's second season Zords were probably our best examples to date. But while Hasbro are pushing Megazords into a more dexterous, flexible, poseable direction, they're doing so at the detriment of something that we all admittedly took for granted, which was how buttery, to quote Bridge from SPD, the connections were. There was a nice, fluid, muscle memory to the transformations of old. Each transformation movement had a beautiful revolution to them. There were ratchets, there were clicks. Here, you get these often quite violent and angry snaps and pop sounds. Ratchets and clicks versus snaps and pops. I realize how silly that sounds and maybe there's a better way to describe it, but what I mean is transforming Bandai's originals often felt like connecting cogs in a machine. Everything was like a note in a song. Whereas here, 
Everything feels like an A to B motion in isolation and you feel after each one like you're scared something might have broken. Hasbro need to find the rhythm for Power Rangers because something keeps getting lost in translation with the Lightning Collection. While I believe there's more effort going into the designs, they're not always finding the optimum way of doing it. Like, why are we using these horrible fold-out peg ports to attach the legs just because SOC did it? The original used a much more natural and show accurate way, and if we are comparing to SOC they managed to hide the pegs much better. Beyond this I also need to critique the manufacturing part of the company that cast the design in materials and maybe control budgets for how much it's allowed to cost in the first place because they're wrecking the experience. Because whoever is designing is not accounting for the cheap plastic that then gets chosen for the final product. So designs that probably were prototyped using more, shall we say, optimum materials are reaching us, the consumer, as half-hearted, budget-sealing compromises that feel and behave more like bootlegs. This can't continue because otherwise the line won't. Turns out the real green candle is money. So that's it. I hope this was useful for you guys. I'm emotionally exhausted by this thing. On the one hand, it looks good and there's something to like in each of the modes. On the other, I'm so disappointed by the cheapness of how it's been realized, to the point where I've had to compromise in this review in order to even show it. Astro Megazord has got to be better, right? I'm a little wary that it's even larger. Let's see what happens. Until then, let me know if you're getting or have already got Zap Dragon's Ord. Let me know if they do another production run of it, maybe with more dependable quality. We can dream, surely. Until the next time, you guys, see you later.